Hey guys, uh, this is the second response video. It's your response video. Um, let's see, I wrote down a few notes. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a response to radical empiricism, and we were just talking about the implications of what that means, and um, sort of the thing, some of the things that I've mentioned. And I like to just, you know, cross analyze some of the things that you've mentioned. And so yeah, um, we mentioned uh, we were talking about oneness and what exactly that means in, in relation to uh, non-dualness. And you're kind of asking, like, what did I mean exactly by oneness? Did I mean non-dualness? Did I mean oneness? Um, honestly, I, I wasn't putting too much thought into that. Um, but now that I'm reflecting, I probably mentioned uh, oneness and, and two-ness because uh, in Brief History of Everything, he was sort of mentioning, you know, um, uh, let's see if I I don't know where the book is right now, but uh, Wilbur was just mentioning, you know, two-ness is artificial or, so to speak, more illusory than this grounding of oneness. But I guess you could say uh, whether or not he meant primordial awareness or non-dualness, we can refer back to that, too, and sort of add that into the perspective. Um, in fact, you, you go another step further and then explore that two-ness as not necessarily being a negative thing, but possibly also being... Uh, a fruitful thing, as something that actually helps us evolve, and this sort of balance between uh, of tunis uh, is what they mentioned in Taoism, uh, yin yang, uh, masculine and feminine energies working in harmony, and in Taoism, at least they say, by grounding yourself in this prim primordial isness, this natural um, way of the universe, you harmonize masculine and feminine. It's not that masculine and feminine utterly disappear or eradicated. It's just that the energies are no, are no, are no longer really dissonant or fragment, fragmented. Instead, you are resting in the ground of primordial awareness or non-duality. And from that, um, the, health, the universe is born healthy. The, uh, the different, the two-ness, the duality is a healthy duality. It's a harmony. And um, I guess you could say that's one of the greater understandings, uh, greater teachings of the Tao, is how to reconcile uh, non-duality, oneness, and two-ness. Uh, so, or I guess you could say oneness being unity, you know? Because I, I'm, now, now this is, to go into what you're saying, um, you mentioned emptiness is form, form is emptiness. Same sort of thing. Um, and I guess you could break this down. You can say emptiness is form. Okay. So by resting in this non-duality, in this emptiness, in this void, um, even in quantum physics they say, like, you know, the void of space is full of potentialities. Um, in fact, bustling full of potentialities to the point where we don't understand why it's not, you know, cat you know why there's not cataclysmic energy just bursting through. But uh, anyway, um, so emptiness is form. Out of this emptiness, all form arises. Um, and then you can get this two-ness, you can understand this two-ness through this uh, statement, emptiness is form. Because this form begins as one, and then two, and then four, and then, you know, it fragments and splits, breaks into our reality. Um, but the harmonic way is, of course, is to have the balance of yin-yang. And a lot of different schools of Eastern contemplation sort of explain this, you know, non-duality, this emptiness, giving birth to the many forms of the universe, but ultimately residing and still abounding somehow in this emptiness. Um, and, and this is often experiential. I mean, they're not just, you know, claiming this. Uh, a lot of mystics and sages tend to say, you know, we've experienced this, and you can too. And interestingly enough, I... Let's see, let me see if I can get the exact term. Um, there's actually a term for this kind of experience called emanationism, and this is very interesting. I even had a friend who experienced this um, kind of mystical experience. You experience this great unity light consciousness, right? Um, and then from that unity consciousness, that great light, that love, ultimate infinity, like uh, it, the light fragments and splits into all forms. So it's basically like this... this um, you, you basically are experiencing the Big Bang, you know, an explosion of potentiality um, crystallizing and forming the universe as we see it, becoming the different forms. The, the, the unity light breaks into a thousand 
um, crystals, you know, but they're all sharing parts of that great unity light that it began with. So, yeah. I just thought that this rung a bell when we were talking about this. Um, so, yes, I, I don't think there's any problem between resting in primordial awareness and also understanding form, at least uh, from a sage's per perspective. Um, and then we're also talking about ego and the death of the ego and what that actually uh, what that actually means. Now, um, it's not that the ego is totally destroyed. I don't think I, I don't think I meant to say that, um, but it, there is a death of the ego. Um, and I know you're mentioning that you know the ego is sort of a platform for higher forms of um, awareness and consciousness. It allows us to experience you know ourselves. It allows us to talk here. You and me are talking. Um, However, there are certain changes and shifts that happen during this evolution of the self to these greater forms of awareness, from egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric, that even though it is holistic in that it retains the ego, many aspects of the ego go through transformations, go through many deaths, I guess you could say. Uh, a lot of insecurities and old psychological boundaries that the ego once had in order to define itself are the things that dissolve. Um, I guess I, I'd like to be more clear about that. That's what I was really meant, that's what I was really trying to, to convey. Um, so, as Krishnamurti says, you know, one must totally die in, in order to truly live. And what, he means the same sort of thing. Um, this ego death is really just a death of the old forms of the ego that must evolve. And if you see this through evolution, or through an evolutionary perspective, um, this can be a less. This can be, I guess you could say, a teacher or a lesson, like you're mentioning. But you know, um, and any kind of evolutionary shift, certain things are let go of in order to embrace newer, more comprehensive things. So, I mean, think about even just the case of an amphibian evolving into a reptile or a fish evolving into a repti uh, uh, amphibian. There are sort of certain component parts which le are let go. Of. The fish lets uh, lets go of its gills. It lets go of its fins. It lets go of its uh, it lets go of its, some of its uh, you know its scaly nature or whatever, and becomes more amphibious. It lets it's, it begins this transition of the letting go, and certain things die. Certain things are let go of. Certain aspects of what define the fish are released, so that it's completely transformed. But it includes something that it will never let go of. And in fact, if you look at evolution physiologically. We still haven't let go of, you know, the four, um, the four limbs, you know, two, two legs, two arms. I mean, this is like the primordial basics of, you know, the fish, or so, so to speak. So it's not that totally we let go of everything, but the ego goes through certain processes. It lets go of certain aspects that can no longer function in these higher dimensions. We must evolve and adapt. So I think that's what I was, mean I was really meaning. Um, but the ego can be a teacher. I mean, it can be... It can demonstrate to us how to evolve. It can, it can, it can help us connect to people. It help us experience this consciousness, experience this life, and it can help us um, even through its problems, through its death, through its its um, through our rejection of growing up. I mean, there are certain aspects that we define ourselves of: our boundaries, our insecurities, our emotional. Um, I guess you could say we can get tied up in the yarn of complex emotional insecurities these things are for the most part you know they must be let go of in order to truly step out of ourselves and that is the de that's the death part of the ego the part the, to be able to go to this world centric perspective we have to let go of some of the boundaries that have inhibited um or prohibited us from doing so and that's what it truly means i guess you could say so the ego evolves it exists but it evolves it becomes more of a pure platform which I think is what the mystics say in a lot of the religions, you know, the ego becomes sort of like, the sage is pure, open to all things, like a reflection of a mirror, um, or the water on a pond, the surface of the water on a pond. Um, let's see. And I, I liken this to sort of a evolutionary, I mean, imagine this, you know, you have a relative perspective, you, you see the earth, you see the moon, and that's all you see. But somehow something helps you evolve, and you take this huge leap from suddenly seeing just one planet and its moon to the solar system, to the galaxy, suddenly there are certain things you're going to have to let go in order to truly appreciate that grounding, this great awareness. But, um, yes, thanks for listening, and uh, please, by all means, continue the discussion. This is great.